the 16th episode of When the Heart Leads. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Newberg, and Ooh, this is the 16th episode. This one is called A New Morphogenetic Field. And I'm laughing a little bit as I'm saying that title because it sounds really esoteric. Um, but what it really means, all it really means is a creating a, a whole new realm of possibility. And humans are really good at this. So um, as a quick example, uh, when we first broke the four minute mile, right? So for a long, long time, no one had broken the four minute mile. Uh, we didn't know that it was possible to do something like that. And then one day someone did it, right? Something uh, within them said, this is possible, I'm gonna do it. And they did it. And then suddenly, once that kind of barrier had been broken, lots and lots and lots of people started to, uh, maybe not lots of people, right? But certainly more people uh, began ra running four minute miles because this realm of possibility had suddenly become manifested in our collective consciousness that this is something we can do, All right? And so um, I'll admit that I sat for a long time before pressing play on this video because in some ways it feels like this, what I'm gonna talk about in this episode is, is kind of a, a big manifesto for me. It's something I've been sitting with, not to like build it up a lot, right? Because it's all just steps on the journey. Right, but I'm really, I feel really re ready to share what this morphogenetic field that I've been sitting with for a long, long time, uh, what it really is. And it won't probably come as any sort of drastic surprise if you've been following, um, following me and following my work. But uh, if you're just tuning in, if you've never uh, tuned into an episode of When the Heart Leads, um, I'll pop in with a question oftentimes that I'm really working with, sitting with living as Rilke would say, like living the, the question I'm living now, right? And I, and I articulate it through, through these episodes, I really articulate some of the things that I'm coming, uh, that I, that's coming to the surface, that's emerging as truth for me. And so when I do these episodes, it's, they're very alive because um, there's always kind of an underlying question there for me and what I'm working with. And right now I'm working with this morphogenetic field. Um, and just to take a quick step back, if we have been, if you've been following the podcast for the past few weeks, few months, um, you'll know that there's this one episode where we talked about like, well, where do I fit, right? I don't really see my values, my life fitting in the world around me. So where do I fit, right? And this idea of creating a new morphogenetic field is very related to that question because um, what kind of, what was emerging was this idea that whatever it is that we're here to do, to become, to create, right? That is totally unique to us. You could call it our soul purpose. Uh, you could call it kind of like our, even our soul's vow, right? The thing, the thing that only we can do, become, create, right? Um, it's not supposed to fit necessarily because whatever is within us that we're, we're, um, that's emerging right now as true, as truly deeply authentically ours, right? It, often, I believe, will ask us to create a new realm of possibility in the world, an evolved idea, an evolved knowing that comes to be visible within the world around us, right? And so that's why a lot of us are driven by this question, I don't know where I fit, right? I don't really see myself reflected in the, in the systems, in the, in the ways of the world around me. Right? And part of that is because we're being called to create whatever it is for us, new morphogenetic fields. And if I'm bringing this up, right, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what this field is for me. Um, if I'm bringing this up, it means that it's, it's really seeding itself or has already seeded itself in the collective consciousness already. So maybe I'm just going to be putting words to something that you've been feeling for a long time. Right? And I believe that my articulation of this has come from me wrestling with this question for a very, very long time. Um, and so I'm really looking at, in some ways, to put it simply, I'm really looking at uh, what, are, what are new models for us to, to, to create around prosperity and abundance. And even if you want to use the word business, right, maybe that's not the word that we're going to be using in this new realm of possibility. But right now, like, that's kind of the, the realm I'm looking at. 
right? And I believe I've been really sitting with this question of what would be deeply resonant? What would be a deeply resonant way of um, creating prosperity for myself, for others, right? What would be what would be a way to do that that feels really good, that feels really resonant, right? And so um, this new way, you could say this new way of business, of prosperity, of abundance, right? It starts within the self always as an embodied. We talked about in the last um, episode, we talked about how it was truly an embodied state. And that was the first realm of manifestation, right? Um, and I'm going to actually start by drawing from a passage from my memoir, because um, I really articulate it well here. And like I said, I've been thinking about this for a very, very long time, wrestling with this question. If you've been following my work, you know that I did my doctoral research on workplace burnout, right? And I was looking at the systemic reasons, like the systemic mechanisms that created burnout. And so I've been sitting with this for a long time, like the, the, the kind of the types of entanglements that we have around work, money, and then survival, right? And um, our world, it feels like there's been an intensification in our world recently to, to create these new models. Uh, because if you're anything like me or the people I know, uh, there have been, it feels like there's been kind of an intensification increase in um, just having our basic needs met, right? And maybe I'm speaking um, specifically for the country I'm in now, for I, I'm in, in the U.S., right? But it feels like, especially in the U.S., where I am, like our basic needs as a population has just been harder and harder to meet, right? So I think maybe we could say the game that we've been playing up until now, it's no longer working. It's really not working. And so what would be a new way to move in the world? What would be a new way... Uh, a new possibility that we can draw toward ourselves uh, to really to move in the world in a way that feels good, that feels resonant, and that allows for all of those needs to be met. So these are questions I've been really, really sitting with, right? And so I'm gonna I'm gonna read a passage. Um, this is so this is from my my second book, Finding Home, a Mystical Memoir, and in a in a large part, like the, the overarching kind of movement of this book was me kind of coming back into the world in a real way. And, and we've talked about that from the very beginning of this podcast, the, the coming down from the mountain, right? Coming down from wherever our place, if we've been in a place of solitude or retreat, like right? how to come back into the world and yet not be consumed by it again, not be buffeted by it again. And in many ways, this book is kind of the story of how I have been doing that. And so um, I'm going to read a passage from here because even back when I was, this was, this happened while I was in France a few years ago, right? And even back then I was really sitting with this question, how do I come back in the world in a way where I don't have to barter my soul again, right? So to speak, you could put it that way. Um, and it doesn't feel, that doesn't feel like too dramatic of a statement, honestly, for some of the ways that we're asked um, to meet our needs right now with the with the systems that exist. So I said, um, so this was kind of a moment where I was where I suddenly just be of clarity for me. And I'd been running um, just a little bit of context. I'd been on a run in the um, the valley. It's this beautiful valley in the middle of France. Um, and everywhere you go, there's the uh, the Basilica of Mary Magdalene was just kind of like this sentinel around the entire valley. And it was beautiful. It was like if you, if a fairy tale was made flesh, right? That's what this valley felt like. And I was on a run in these kind of paths that seemed the valley that kind of would run along vineyards and beautiful countryside, um, like fields of wheat, right? Wildflowers, just, it was the most, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I was on a run and I just had this moment of clarity and I said, I have, oh, if you're following along, by the way, we're on page 180 if you have the book. Um, and so on page 180, I said, I have my own ideas, my own plans, my own destiny. But can I move back into the world, the world of money and people and resources, taxes and economics and bank accounts, and still live compatibly with my values and needs? 
as a quick side note, I, w I had been, I had spent at this point over a year in solitude. Um, so I, I'd, I'd been really removed from all of that. Like I'd been able to live in a way that was very removed. So this was a really big question for me, right? Um, cause there was a part of me that knew I wasn't meant to stay there kind of hermetically sealed in my solitude, right? There's a part of me that knew I had to come back. I was really wrestling with this question of how to do it because I had been so buffeted. You know, um, there's a reason I did my doctoral research on burnout, right? Because it, it just had felt like, um, just such a deep betrayal of self, right? In that world. And yet it was the only game I knew, right? So this was a, this was a big question for me. So I said, can I allow money to become a joyful inflow in response to the light of my soul as it is, my own precious light spills into the world. Can I let, and this one is big, can I let transactions happen without being caught in the exchange, without becoming transactional myself? The prevailing profile of a successful business is so at odds with what I have come to know about myself. To be successful, I've been taught, I must overcome all obstacles through the sheer force of my raw willpower. I must strong arm my way through barriers, force my ideas and products down the throat of others, take dramatic leaps with my money and resources, prove myself worthy, defeat the competition, and generally exhaust myself in the name of my dream. Is this sounding familiar? Maybe this is sounding familiar to some of us, right? But I said, I cannot live like that again. When I did in the past, I was often lauded for my strength and resilience, but I was also perpetually unwell. The returns on my energy seemed small and dearly bought. So I'm gonna skip down a little. And I said, can I start a business in a gentle way, a loving way, a calm way? Uh, dare I say it, a way that feels joyful and yes, fun. I wonder, how can I take responsibility for a business to urge it into growth and expansion while also maintaining the serenity, stillness, joy, and spaciousness that is essential for my well-being? So some big questions here. I'm going to put the book down for a moment. I might come back to it. Um... This was a big, this was, is, right, a big question. And so coming back to this idea of, of a morphogenetic field, right, what I'm really asking in some ways is, is it possible to create a whole new realm of possibility so that we can move, create, amplify prosperity in the world in a way that feels really resonant with our deepest essence, with who we are, right? And... It takes a lot of courage to choose it, to choose something different from the game that we've been playing, right? That we've been shown um, is the way forward, right? There's lots of, um, I think we've all been indoctrinated with that. Uh, indo and yeah, indoctrinated, no, that's not too strong of a word. I think there's been many, many belief systems layered over the top of what's really possible for us. You know, belief systems like you have to do stuff you don't like in order to make money right? There's all sorts of things, right? Um, and so the old model, we could say, because I'm calling it the old model, because I believe it is phasing out. There's enough of us willing to open to, a, to an idea of a new way of creating prosperity and of giving our gifts, right? That that could become a new morphogenetic field in the, um, in the, in humanity, right? So there's enough, there's enough of us opening. So I'm calling it the old way, right? The old way of kind of self-betrayal, in order to make money, doing stuff that you don't like in order to make money, um, kind of going against what Parker Palmer would say, going against the grain of your soul just to make ends meet, right? We can see more and more that this model is just not working anymore, right? The old game is not working even a, even a little bit right now. So, I wrote, when I worked from the old model, it was very stressful, right? So I was, like I said, I was perpetually unwell. 
right? So is it possible to move in the world in a way that's authentic, really authentic, and also creates prosperity, right? Because what we've been taught is that money is kind of at odds with like making money is at odds with peace or I have to choose between peace and money or well-being and money or joy and money, right? All these things. And I talk, actually, I'm pointing at this because it's up there, but my book, my first book, A New Eden Paradise Retold, um, I do talk a lot about that in that book as well, is this, this new way of opening to prosperity. And so um, I'm just glancing at my notes because I have a lot of notes for this, but I think I covered a lot of this, right? Um, just about how I've been asking this question for a long time uh, since experiencing really deep burnout, right? Since coming back into the world, uh, coming, you could say coming down from the mountain, right? On my own. Uh, and then trying to pick up these old games, right? Which is what they feel like. But these games, they're they're not fun anymore. Right? The old games of maybe trying to put forward something inauthentic. Um, there's all there's all sorts of of maxims out there or philosophies out there around what we need to do to be successful in this world. But maybe there's a, a better way, a different way, a way that doesn't even involve playing games at all. Right. And I felt that yesterday as I was wrestling with some big decisions I've been thinking about regarding moving forward, regarding like how to be in the world, regarding business and money. And I, and there was a big, there's a part of me that was just strategizing, 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 right? Like my brain, if you know me, if you've play, if you've, if you've known me, you'll know that I'm good. I'm pretty good at games. Like I'm pretty good at strategizing. Like I've played sports my whole life. I love, I love all that stuff. Right. But there's a part of it that just was, has become exhausted with it, right? Like trying to fit into the old model has just become exhausting. Trying to strategize and scheme, trying to become this or that, trying to morph or adapt in ways that I think will result in this or that, right? And as we, as we uncover these layers, we, we can find that, that that kind of morphing or adapting or um, shape shifting could become more and more and more subtle. Right? And I think that we're moving into when we're really committed to creating a new morphogenetic field, a new realm of possibility for how to do things. Right, It's going to ask us to go all the way in, into those subtlest layers and release them. Right, And, and the, the words that came to me in that um, were just, was just like, this game, I don't want to play it anymore. I'm putting it down. Right. You pretend, I pretend, we pretend, right? Uh, I don't want to play it anymore. What would happen if I just put it down? It's become too exhausting, right? And if you're just tuning in, I'm talking about creating a new morphogenetic field around abundance, prosperity, around giving and receiving that feels good, right? That doesn't require us to betray ourselves, our values, our heart, our soul, right? And this is possible and it's something we're discovering together right? Because enough of us are asking this question that we can start to move into that space, right? But it is asking us to, to just release at those deepest, subtlest layers, any belief systems we have that are still attached to the old model that requires, seems to require betrayal, right? That seems to draw our sourcing from somewhere other than our deepest essence, right? Who we truly are. So, I've been doing some work on this lately, and I'm going to bring you in a little bit to that work, right? Because like we said, it starts with embodiment, right? And I have this, this vision, right, of, of living in the world, moving in the world, giving in the world in a way that is truly authentic, right? And it doesn't mean, and I want to put this, um, this doesn't mean that there isn't potentially you could say hard work involved, right? But the work, what I'm going to go into is the feel of that, how good it feels, right? How good it feels like this, this isn't, um, this isn't, uh, the, the kind of work that 
feels um, like a burden or an obligation. This is the kind of work that feels like it opens you, like you're excited to move into it. Like it's a, I almost see it as like you've reached the level of virtuoso, right? And so you're just, you're just pulling, playing from your mastery in this work, right? And so many of us have a, a, attained these levels of mastery in whatever it is, right? That's so aligned with our soul's calling, right? And I think about, um, when you think about uh, someone playing the violin, right? That doesn't, that's, I mean, yes, it's, it's focus. It's, um, it's, it can be work, right? But it's also like this beautiful demonstration of their art and their mastery, right? So someone who's like at those high, high levels of musicianship, right? That's what I'm talking about. We're becoming the virtuosos, right? Of our lives, of our work, of our gifts, right? So we're drawing, we put in the work to become these powerful masters of whatever it is that's aligned with our soul, of whatever it is that we're meant to give, right? And for me, in a lot of ways, that is um, part of it is writing, right? I've been writing, it's it's natural to me, but I've also put in lots and lots and lots of hours, um, enjoyable hours, right? Most of them enjoyable, but just there's been this this unrelenting focus on communicating through words for me, right? And I'm coming to this level where I'm seeing all the different ways that now that it's like a level of mastery, right? All the different ways that that level of mastery can come forward and be put together in so many different constellations, right? So many different ways that it doesn't feel, even though it's, I can, I could spend eight, nine hours working on something, right? It doesn't feel like work because it feels so aligned, right? So as I'm talking about this new way, right? I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that it's not going to involve work, but what I'm saying is that, that it's this joyful work, this work that opens you, this work that feels like as you strike it, there's a chord in your soul that's, that sings back, right? And so, um, and that is where we're, we're turning our focus. Those of us interested in creating a new morphogenetic field, a new realm of possibility for how to create prosperity, right? That is where we're turning. We're turning toward our mastery and nothing less will satisfy us. All right, so I'm going to bring you into this vision a little bit. So I, in meditation today, I saw something that really helped, um, helped put a, um, like a vision, a feeling to what I'm talking about. And if you follow my work, you'll know, I, I, I've mentioned a few times, I meditate every day. It's a practice. Kind of, I wake up and I go in and I receive. That's a, this really peaceful place just upon waking. And I've worked a lot with uh, Kabbalistic dream work. So that moment of awakening, right, um, is such a powerful liminal space to move into meditation for me because I, I'm not, my rational mind hasn't kicked in yet. And so I can, I'm much more open. I'm in these relaxed brainwave states and I can begin to receive. So I do that every morning is how I start my day. And so I get messages every day and I record them every day. And, and today has just felt like it wanted to be shared because I was really asking this question. And what I saw was kind of a figure, you could say, um, enrobed in light. And I'm bringing you, I'm really bringing you into some of these depths here because these are, these are those gifts um, that come to me that now um, this one, I think this vision was, this, this vision was so powerful and so related to this that I'm going to share it. So there's a, there's a figure, she was enrobed in light, you could say, standing. And it was almost like a, like a singing from her. And when she sang, or when she, and I think, and the other thing that came forward is like, she almost offered like a flower of her heart. Like it, it came forward from her heart into her hands and she offered it to another. And as that was being gifted, it was almost like if there was a, a water level around her, like the water level rose and the light amplified. And in that giving, in that giving, all was amplified, everything. So there was this ecstasy to it. There was this communion to it. There was this beauty to it where in the giving of that, there is this joyful giving, this beauty, right? The beauty of the flower of the heart being given to another. And in that giving, 
they light up and then you light up, right? Or the figure lights up and everything around you rises, right? And so this is the model. Like that was a beautiful vision of the model that I'm talking about of the new morphogenetic field. Because when we talk about something like burnout, what we're talking about is, is giving in a way where our light is not reflected back to us. Our light, our gifts, our genius, our mastery, right, is not reflected back to us. And so oftentimes it feels like that we give and we give and we give and we're depleted. And maybe we get a paycheck. Maybe. Maybe our labor isn't even paid for, right? Um, in many relationships, that's what that's true. Right? So it's unpaid, you could say, labor, right? Maybe we get a paycheck. So that becomes transactional. So when I talked about in the book, is it is there a way to um how did I put it? I really like the way I put it, so I'm gonna read it again. I wrote, um, can I let transactions happen without being caught in the exchange, without becoming transactional myself, right? And the way to do that, the way to really live that is to allow your light to be amplified because there's nothing transactional about that. There is a giving, right? And there's a receiving and there's this simultaneous giving and receiving, that amplifies everything, the joy, the ecstasy, the light, the satisfaction, the fulfillment, right? We talk a lot about deep fulfillment, right? Versus like a transaction. You have gotten eight hours of my time today. I received this much money, right? That's kind of the old model. That still might happen, right? You still might offer your time in that way, but in the exchange, right? And when you know you're in the right place with the right people doing the right things, that exchange is not going to feel like the, like the bare bones of that transaction. You don't become that transaction, right? The transaction occurs in this larger space of amplified light, right? And that's, that's when I'm talking about a new morphogenetic field, I'm talking about that being the feel the barometer of how we give and receive. And I want to mention that that's not, um, so this figure, right, with the lotus or with the flower of the heart, th this figure isn't, this is very important, right? This is very important. This figure is not giving indiscriminately. I'm going to be doing a, um, a shamanic journey workshop possibly next month, we're working on scheduling it um, in the place where I live. And I very specifically chose um, the word channel in the title of this workshop, because when you think about a channel, right, in order for a channel to be its most powerful, there can't be any leaks anywhere, right? So when and I think it's going to be something like channeling the soul vow or the soul purpose or something like that, right? But the word channel is very clear to me because when we're talking about this, this amplification of giving and receiving, right? This amplification of light that happens when we give, when we receive, right? From the deepest space of our heart, the flower of our heart, that is not something everybody gets to have, right? And I, um, I talk about this both in my memoir and my first book, The New Eden Paradise Retold, how when I first emerged from my awakening, I didn't, I really didn't understand that the giving could not be indiscriminate. So to put it another way, without so many double negatives, I didn't understand I couldn't just give love to everybody, right? In that way, because it created too many leaks, right? And I would end up giving in places where my light wasn't being amplified, sent and return to me, right? And, and when it comes to, if we're going to talk about the divine, right, the way the divine operates is that all giving in that divine space is immediately automatically amplified. So all giving becomes a form of receiving in that space. 
And so we know when we're in resonance with that divine giving, because it is such an immediate response, energetically, um, financially, yes, right? Maybe not, maybe that's not immediate, right? But there's always going to be some sort of amplification. That's how you know you're on the right track. So when I think about the ways, like the channels, right? We're talking about channels. When I think about the channels through which I give and receive, what are the channels that seem to amplify my light, my love, my joy, my energy, my inspiration, right? The ones I truly enjoy existing in. And then what are the channels that feel like transactional or that feel um, like when I enter into that space, I am depleted, right? And more and more, right, that space of depletion is, that's, that's the game that we're not going to play anymore. That's the game that we're just choosing not to play. Because, and this is a big leap of, of trust, to begin to turn toward those channels, those places, where when we give our light is amplified, our joy is amplified, our inspiration is amplified. Right. And, and it might be something simple, like there's a person who every time you talk to them, you come away feeling ecstatic, energized, alive, right? That's the feeling that we're calling into every space in our lives, including the way we receive money, including the way that we are, the ways that we are resourced. Okay. Because more and more and more those channels of depletion are going to be intensified so that we, they are no longer tenable, right? It's like, it's almost like watching a river dry up. And there's going to come a time when there's just no more water in the river. And then we'll be forced to turn to the other places. Right, but that would be very stressful. So what I'm offering here is a way to start bringing that into your life, right? In a way, in a way where we can begin to turn away from sourcing in that way that depletes us, right? And gently rise, let all parts of our life rise to that place where all channels of giving and receiving, all relationships, all partnerships, right, including the ones that result in money, right, where all of those feel like that one conversation that you have with that friend, right? And this is possible. This is the morphogenetic field we're talking about, where it is possible for that amplification to reach every part of our lives, including the part of our lives that gives and receives money. And so this is, in some ways, it's a, it's a, it's a deep confronting of, of fear and scarcity, right? That can, again, exist at those subtler and subtler layers. But where we're moving into, there's just no model for scarcity, right? Because everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, everything's amplified. And we know that when we give that lotus of our heart to another, they're amplified, and we're amplified. And when they give that lotus to us, we're amplified and they're amplified, right? So in no way is there a transaction, a bare bones transaction or a depletion. There is simply the ecstatic communion of giving and receiving. So The feel, okay, so I've, I've outlined what would this feel like, right? So we've talked about how it feels like an amplification, how my inspiration is almost like boomeranged back to me in every moment, right? How do I move forward? How, how do I, you know, personally, so let's just bring it back to the level. Like we talked about this morph genetic field. We've talked about this vision, right? 
and in some ways that's kind of abstract, but then coming back to the, just like, how do I make this, nudge this into existence in my life, right? And it doesn't have to happen right away, right? So the, the first thing I would, I would offer is the first thing is scan your life, maybe all the different relationships, the different parts of it. And, and right away, something's going to pop up that part of your life where you feel that amplification in the giving and the receiving, right? And it might be a relationship. It might be um, a partnership. It might be an activity, right? Whatever it is, start there. That's the feeling, right? That's the feeling that we're then going to begin. We're going to begin to populate all aspects of our life so that all incoming and outgoing channels, right? Which are the same. They're, all channels are in and out, right? They're plugged up because we're not giving indiscriminately to those who don't amplify our light. Situations, opportunities, invitations, people, relationships, workplaces, right? We begin to see what does and what doesn't. And I'm not saying quit your job tomorrow, right? Maybe you will, that's fine, totally. You, you will be held by the universe, right? But what I'm saying is just bring that into your awareness. If your job or your way of making money or this relationship or that relationship, don't amplify your light. They don't belong in the new evolutionary model that we're moving into as a species. <laughs> Humanity is evolving. And the way we're evolving is by choosing that which lights us up, right? And so begin there because the feeling of that relationship that lights you up or that situation that lights you up or that activity that lights you up, right? That feeling is the feeling that you're going to use as a barometer for all other things, for all other channels, including the way it, it's not like all these things, the way a lot of us think is like all these parts of my life, like I'm allowed to feel good, but this part of my life, I can't like, and this part could be my marriage or my job or whatever. Like, the light can't touch that part. That's just a part I have to endure. No, we're moving into the place where all parts of our life are lifted into that place of ecstasy, of ecstatic giving and receiving, right? That's the morphogenetic field I'm talking about, that that is possible and we are creating it. No way. No way that's possible. No way any, we could run a four minute mile, but someone believed it and did it. And then suddenly it was happening, right? So this is what I'm saying is possible. And not just me, right? Lots and lots of us are coming to this. So how does it feel? What are ways to nudge it forward, right? Again, it doesn't necessarily happen overnight, right? But first we have the barometer. We have that conversation, that relationship that we know feels good, right? And then we begin to use that. Does this feel like that? Does this job opportunity invitation feel like that? Oh, it doesn't? Okay. It's probably not right because I want everything to feel like that, that channel, right? So the way I wanted this in my own life to move forward is through things that come really naturally to me. So exciting conversations, right? opportunities that come through exciting conversations. That's, I love having exciting conversations, right? That doesn't feel like something I have to do to endure to get something I want, right? That sounds like something I want anyway, right? And so that's one way that I put out there that I want um, you know, new opportunities to come in through just having conversations that excite me. And, 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 and in that I am fulfilled already. If I'm having an exciting, inspiring conversation, I'm already fulfilled. I don't need anything to come of it, right? So that already feels amplified. Um, allowing myself to be guided by those places, those people, those things, those opportunities that just feel good, right? Those nudges, right? We talked about, uh, I think it may have been two episodes ago, talked about following those nudges, those internal nudges that happen when I say meditate, right? Those nudges oftentimes come when I'm in that quiet space, right? What are those nudges telling me to do, right? The nudges that occur when I'm 
when my mind is quiet, when I'm in a place of strength, of peace, that's when I can trust the messages that come in. If I'm in a place of fear or worry or anxiety, the messages come in then, right? That amplify the anxiety or fear. I know those aren't, that's not my heart speaking. That's not the divine speaking. That's not the nudge, right? So I wait until the water calms, settles. I do what I need to do. I call, I ask for help to come to that place of stillness, of serenity. And those are the nudges that come through that place that I follow, right? So the nudges, the conversations, um, the invitations to do things that feel good and exciting, right? Those are the things I'm paying attention to right now. And in that, there is no forcing, there is no proving, there is no compromise of my values. There can be flexibility, right? And I've talked about the difference between flexibility and compromise, right? Compromise is where you go against the grain of your soul. There's none of that. Flexibility is where you allow for things to shift and change, right? In that space of trust, that's fine. We allow for, flexibility is fine. Compromise is not, there's no compromise in this channel, in this new morphogenetic field. There's no need for it. It doesn't even exist there. It's like, it's like, it's not a concept that can survive this leap in ev evolution. Proving, striving, um, I said pounding on doors, right? If you're having to pound on a door, it's probably not the right door, right? In my experience, the feeling of stepping up and having the door open for me, right? And being welcomed in, that's the feeling, right? So if you're pounding on a door, it's probably not the right door, right? Um, and none of that, again, when we take that leap into, like with that friend who you have great conversations with, there's no pounding on that door, right? That, the, there's no, the striving, the compromising, the proving yourself to that person, none of it exists, right? That, that's a foreign concept in that channel, right? So you can see how when we begin to let that feeling take over every aspect of our lives, suddenly all these old games we've been playing just drop away on their own. They just don't make sense anymore. They just don't make sense, right? If you've, um, if you're like me and maybe you've overcome an addiction, right? Truly overcome it. Uh, and I, overcome is a tough, I, I mean, I was, I was, I was given kind of a, like a gift of release of that, right? Um, but there is an aspect sometimes of overcoming, but now it just doesn't exist in my realm, the addiction, right? It's just not there. It doesn't even occur to me to, to turn toward that addiction anymore. It's, it doesn't exist in my field, right? And the same thing is going to happen. We create this new morphogenetic field, this new realm of possibility around giving and receiving prosperity, abundance, money, having our needs, not just met, but exceeded our desires, opening the desires of our heart opening and taking shape around us, right? With all of that, those old models of transaction, of depletion, of forcing, proving, striving, they'll just fall away. They just won't exist. So, I'll leave it at that for right now. The possibility of a new morphogenetic field of being resourced from our deepest essence where there's no need for compromise, for, for self-betrayal, for depletion, right? Where all of our channels are clean and pure and exist in mutual amplification. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, this has been the 16th episode of When the Heart Leads. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Newberg, founder of Books of Eden Publishing. Uh, if you're curious about more of my work, you can visit my website, booksofeden.com. It's got more information on stuff that I do and like to do. From my heart to yours, 